Even if you know each of the seven deadly sins by heart, you probably don't know the true history of how these special vices came to be and why they are so important to Christianity. Let's take a look at the untold truth of the seven deadly sins. People have been pretty fond of listing various prescriptions for how to behave for millennia, long before the Hebrew scriptures and the birth of Christ. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle listed a series of virtues and vices in his works Nicomachean Ethics and Eudemian Ethics. Aristotle argued that true virtue is a balanced point between two extremes of excess and deficiency. For example, acting too rashly is bad, while being too shy and cowardly is no good either. The ideal balancing point between the two is therefore courage. Aristotle also claimed that there was a distinction between temperance and continence, at least when it came to one's moral state. A temperate person is naturally virtuous, while a continent one has all manner of desires but still actively chooses to be righteous despite temptation. The Roman poet Horace also seemed to be fond of listing virtues and vices. In his book Epistles, he wrote that it was important to quote, flee vice, which he rather helpfully listed. The pre-Christian antecedents to the seven deadly sins don't just stop with moralizing philosophers in ancient Greece and Rome. Many schools of Jewish thought discuss the concepts of good inclination and evil inclination. Rabbis sometimes discuss ancient texts in a form of interpretation called a midrash. They generally make it clear that evil inclinations are a fundamental part of human nature and that every person must grapple with them throughout their lives. In fact, that struggle is ongoing. It's oftentimes best supported by a commitment to the faith and a deep relationship with the Torah. Evil inclinations are impulses that can be personified and associated with evil figures such as Satan. It's rarely made out to be quite the same thing as the devil, but more like a set of influences that accompany evil personified. Critically, the situation isn't quite as simple as urging people to completely deny and fight against evil inclinations. It's part of a greater cosmic balance that can push humans toward a greater, more noble path by its example. Though like all sins and vices, it can present a perilously narrow road at times. It wasn't until the 4th century that the steadily growing Christian movement began to put its spin on what constituted sin, and it certainly didn't emerge as the list of seven deadly sins that many of us know today. It started with a reclusive Christian monk named Evangrius Ponticus. He wrote down a list of eight evil thoughts. These could plague his fellow monastics as they tried to become closer with God and resist the temptations and corruption of the world. Those eight evil thoughts were gluttony, lust, avarice, anger, sloth, sadness, vainglory, and pride. Evangelist, however, wasn't necessarily writing for a wider audience. He was involved with the Eastern Christian Church. It took the work of his pupil, John Cassian, to bring Evangelist's list to wider attention in the Western branch of the church. The list was eventually translated into Latin for a broader set of readers. However, it still knocked around for another two centuries or so before it truly began to take hold in the wider Christian world. Officially speaking, the Christian concept of the seven deadly sins didn't begin to take hold until the idea was formally sponsored, so to speak, by one of the biggest names in Christendom, the Pope. In the 6th century, Pope Gregory I got a copy of Evangelist Ponticus's list and rearranged it into the seven deadly sins. He debuted the new take on vice in his analysis of the Bible's book of Job, having rearranged some of the previous list. Gregory also folded sloth into a broader sin categorized as melancholy. Perhaps most notably, he decreed that pride was the worst of all sins. According to Gregory's estimation of things, it was at the root of all the other deadly offenses. St. Thomas Aquinas, a Christian writer working in the 13th century, later agreed with Pope Gregory, explaining that pride is essentially a form of thumbing your nose at God's will and authority. In the medieval world, learned commentaries and Latin Bibles were only really available to illiterate few. Therefore, the speeches delivered by local priests and the lessons imparted in church artworks were key to maintaining religious orthodoxy. Seven cardinal virtues and seven deadly sins used as teaching tools. Yeah, 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 like in uh, the Parsons' tale in... And given that the sins seemed ready-made for graphic representation, it's no wonder that medieval Europe went positively gaga over the concept. It didn't end at just murals or moralizing sermons. Medieval Christians saw the seven deadly sins reflected in their churches, art, plays, and many more arenas. They were often depicted under Latin names with a complicated hierarchy of sin and its various fruits. Most common folk probably didn't quite grasp the many ways in which the deadly sins could be dissected and analyzed. However, they would have been well aware of the effects of such evil doing in their lives. And if they were aware, they could more easily confess to their local priest. That or get absolution, do penance, or maybe make it out of their earthly life with only a temporary purgatory sentence and not outright damnation. Medieval sources also often outline seven works of mercy that could help parishioners avoid the worst consequences of sin. 
These include more action-oriented tasks like giving out food and water, donating clothing, and making sure the dead receive a proper burial. Since practically the beginning of the seven deadly sins as a Christian concept, theologians have zeroed in on pride as the worst of them all. But why is it so much worse than lust or greed? First, pride is one of those rather vague sins that, despite its deadly classification, is kind of hard to nail down. It can be applied in any number of ways, from hubris to more everyday snottiness. Ultimately, however, it boils down to thinking that you are not only better, smarter, and more capable than your human neighbors, but that you might even exceed the intelligence of God. Within the confines of Christian theology, being smarter than God is just about impossible for any person and can only lead to a rather deadly kind of arrogance. What'd you do? Screw up like the Beatles and say you were bigger than Jesus? All the time. It was the title of our second album. If you think you're better than a deity or its representatives, then you probably won't want to humble yourself and take their advice, after all. Philosophers and theologians like Pope Gregory I believe that pride is ultimately at the root of all other sins. Envy is most often described as wanting what your neighbor has to the point where your relationship with this person is utterly destroyed. It's not strictly about wanting material things, though. Envy is a bit more refined than that. It's really about wanting the status that is associated with having something. For example, wanting the acclaim and admiration that often comes along with having a large, richly appointed mansion rather than the home itself. Envy is also understood as a cold-blooded sin that's linked more to a person's thoughts than passionate urges. Someone might thoughtlessly give in to something like lust or wrath, but the sin of envy requires a certain kind of calculation, and it's often done consciously and over an extended period. For many, this also means that cold-blooded sins, which can also include pride, sloth, and greed, are worse than the heated ones. This is not least because someone has had the opportunity to think better and choose a more virtuous path. People usually sum up the deadly sin of wrath as anger and leave it at that. But while wrath certainly does include getting mad, it's a bit more complicated than that. Remember that there are certainly occasions where anger can be righteous and justified. Even Jesus is known to have fallen victim to anger, as in the rather infamous incident from the book of Matthew. In the text, he enters the temple, flips a few tables, and upsets moneylenders working there. If Jesus is allowed to get angry every once in a while, when does it all tip over into deadly sin? According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this emotion becomes wrath when it becomes a, quote, deliberate desire to kill or seriously wound a neighbor. And Dante, the medieval Italian poet who was exiled because of political infighting in Florence, zeroed in on wrath as it is expressed through vengeance. Some have made the distinction that the sin of wrath must involve the conscious intent to hurt people or even oneself. Medieval artwork showing the sin doesn't just portray humans harming each other, but also committing harm toward themselves and hot-blooded, unthinking wrath aimed inwards. For medieval church leaders, gluttony wasn't just about stuffing your face with food. It was also about being overly luxurious with your meals, eating too much too quickly or too eagerly. Enjoying food too much or not respecting its role in maintaining one's body is enough to pin you under the mortal sin of gluttony. It's one of the most common sins to fellow Christians throughout various iterations of the seven deadly sins. Perhaps this longevity is because it was considered a special issue for monks and other monastics who specifically tried to avoid these sorts of worldly temptations. For many scholars and religious commentators, gluttony is at its worst when overindulgence gets in the way of one's spiritual life. It can draw in the fellow sins of greed and lust in a way that leads someone astray. Gluttony is another one of those hot-blooded sins. Many have also categorized them as relatively thoughtless animalistic urges that need to be carefully recognized and opposed, lest they lead us astray. In Pope Gregory I Moralia, the 6th century pontiff argues that the sin of gluttony essentially comes at you from five directions. This includes sin of wanting too fine food and of not planning for its distribution properly. If envy is the cold-blooded covetousness of someone else's acclaim in general life, then greed is more its thoughtless cousin. Sometimes also known as avarice, greed is generally understood to be the hoarding of both money and other forms of wealth. Medieval monk and philosopher Roger Bacon despised greed so much that he placed it in the lead for the worst deadly sin. He claimed that it was at the root of nearly every other wrongdoing beyond anger. Later writers, like Dante's mentor Brunetto Latini, further subdivided greed into different categories. As the medieval age progressed into the Renaissance and merchants became more and more prominent, this made the act of defining greed and balancing the need for money-making with spiritual pursuits an increasingly thorny issue. Though it's often interpreted as dealing in only sins of a sexual nature, lust is also about the desire for earthly and sensual pleasures beyond the bedroom. Kevin, it's so basic. Self-love. The all-natural opiate. 
In addition, Cambridge University philosophy professor Simon Blackburn said in an interview with NPR that this sin is somewhat central to life as a human. Unless, of course, you'd prefer a colorless life as a squeaky clean and completely inoffensive monk or nun. Still, it's hard to get away from the sex-related aspect of lust. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines it as inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. It's especially bad when it's been separated from what the Church defines as the act's essential purpose, which is, of course, bringing a married couple together or for making babies. Even taking too much pleasure in it while married can still be considered a sin. Sloth is perhaps the hardest of all the seven deadly sins to pin down. For many, simply defining the sin as laziness is, well, lazy. For St. Thomas Aquinas, writing in his Summa Theological, sloth is sorrow about spiritual good that can lead someone to despair or inaction. In other words, he writes that sloth is an oppressive sorrow which, to wit, so weighs upon man's mind that he wants to do nothing. Sloth can also be expressed as idleness, boredom, and strain from one's true work. And yes, being overly sleepy and lying about in beds are also symptoms of this wide-ranging sin. In many theological estimations of sloth, its worst offense may be in slowing down not just a person's body, but their mind. For as someone is slow to think and consider their place in this world and their actions, how can they ever hope to secure a place in the next? All of these lists of transgressions and the ways you can potentially go astray can certainly lead to a sense of despair. But you can at least take heart in knowing that there are some ways to counteract the effects of the seven deadly sins. Some Christian denominations say that the seven deadly sins are complemented by unique virtues. These acts can potentially get you off the path to hell or purgatory and towards a more righteous final destination. What are those virtues exactly? The Archdiocese of Baltimore contends that the seven capital virtues meant to oppose the seven deadly sins are faith, hope, love, prudence, fortitude, justice, and temperance. A similar concept was espoused by 5th century Christian writer Aurelius Clemens Prudentis. He wrote in his Psychomachia of the seven virtues and seven vices facing off in a kind of cosmic battle for souls. Translated from Latin, Prudentis's seven virtues are chastity, temperance, charity, diligence, patience, kindness, and humility. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about religious history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.